So the two things that I was really hoping would be addressed at General Conference absolutely were. Hi guys. Okay, conference was amazing. It was my first time going to General Conference in the conference building. The last time I went was years ago in the old tabernacle. And it was my son's first time ever going to a general conference. We happened to sit a few rows above our neighbors across the street, so it was kind of fun seeing their family. And while we were taking pictures out front, it's kind of funny, I zoomed in right here, we got a picture of the Ballerina Farm family in the background. <laughs> we had actually been walking next to them the whole time coming out of conference and didn't realize until after the fact that that's who they were. Everyone in Utah looks familiar. <laughs> but it was so awesome to see so many people from all over the world speaking different languages, coming from different cultures, all gathering to the same location, united as the body of Christ. It was amazing. So let's go ahead and talk about the messages that were delivered at conference. And I noticed some patterns that I want to talk about today that have to do with today's video message. So first, I kind of want to walk you through the timeline since the last video message and then show you how those patterns and themes at conference play into that. Okay, so after my last video message, someone reached out to me and said, Lindsay, in your dream video, Revelation chapter 13 and dream, you mentioned seeing a green comet. Is this the same comet in your newest video, a message in the green comet? In your first video, Revelation chapter 13 and my dream, you mentioned that in your dream it was a new year. Do you think the new year could be referring to Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish new year? Do you think that maybe your dream could be coming to pass after Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? I just got spiritual goosebumps texting this to you. Did you happen to make that correlation between your Revelation 13 dream and the green comet you saw then and the green comet in this new video? So real quick, for those of you who are new to my channel, earlier this year, back in February, I put out a video I'll have a link to the full video down below in the video description. And I talked about a dream that I had at that time. If you want to listen to the full dream, go ahead and click on the link down below in the video description. But I'm going to go ahead and share just a small part of that dream right now to shed a little light on what I'm about to share next. I looked out the window of the building and saw a godly looking angelic figure on a horse in the sky. It was massive. It was in the northeast and it rode out of the clouds, looked down at the earth, and then turned as if to summon someone behind him. A second figure on a horse came out, very white and angelic, and looked down at the earth. I wondered if anyone was seeing this. Now, I don't think I could hear anything. We were inside of the building, but I'm looking up and the skies were kind of gray. There were lots of clouds and I'm looking out the window and the figures move from left to right out from behind these clouds and they looked very angelic. It kind of reminds me of a scene from like Lord of the Rings where you have that elf race and they just look so clean and pristine riding on the horses. And I remember looking at them knowing that they were good. Like it just felt very royal, very regal, <laughs> very exciting. Suddenly all of these lights followed, different colors. They lit up the sky like a light show. So it almost seemed like a celebration. All of these beings came out of the clouds and they were kind of just spinning around and moving back and forth like it had been rehearsed and choreographed, like this really amazing celebration. And I remember specifically noticing red and green bright lights and they were moving about and it was so neat to watch, way better than any fireworks show I've ever seen. <laughs> It was all choreographed. There seemed to be music. I noticed people were pointing in awe. 
So I'm inside of a building, but I can tell that there's music coming from the sky and it's getting people's attention. And as I'm looking out the window, I'm seeing people outside looking up at the sky and pointing and just wondering what in the world is that? That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. What is it? My phone rang and it was an old friend who was not a member of the church. I missed the phone call, but she wanted to know what this meant. So she believed that I might have the answers because she knew I was a strong member of the church, a person of faith. And I had lived my life that way on social media where she follows me. So she felt that I would be a good person to reach out to for answers. I came down to the ground and saw a 13 year old boy. He seemed frightened. I told him that it was a sign of the Lord's return and that the judgments were at hand. I remember saying that. I was looking around. Some people were really excited and other people like this boy were frightened because they didn't understand. Somehow in the dream, I knew, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what this meant. And I said to everyone, it's okay, it's okay. This is a good thing. This is exciting. I said, this symbolizes the sixth trumpet. This means that the judgments are about to be poured out upon the wicked. But for those who have been valiant, for those who are on the ark, everything will be okay. There's a plan and these things are about to happen. So I wrote about the boy. He was worried that he was not ready. I told him to repent and to focus on having a kind heart and to love the Lord most. So I remember trying to assure him. I remember saying, I think you're being too hard on yourself. Nobody's perfect, but it's all about your heart. Do you have that desire to put the Lord first in your life and to love him more than anything else? Because if you can make that commitment right now, he can work with that. <laughs> so I remember really trying to cheer for this teenage boy who was so scared. And to me, I feel like that's a little symbolic of where I'm at in my life right now. I'm always at the schools, the junior high school and the high school where there's plenty of teenagers I even have teenage students staying with me right now from Taiwan. And so I feel like I am always surrounded by teenagers and I just have such a desire to help them feel like everything's going to be okay. And there is so much reason to be hopeful and happy. So I always feel like that's what I'm trying to do. So this was symbolic of that. I was then in a church sitting on a pew. It was a stake event. People were whispering about the sign happening in the sky. When I got home, I wanted to call my sister and tell her. Suddenly, there was a countdown. Wow. <laughs> there it is. This dream about a countdown happening on a countdown date. And we all said, Happy New Year. So this is very symbolic of a brand new year. Now, this is interesting because 2022 going into 2023, that New Year's Eve was on a Saturday evening. It was a Saturday going into a Sunday. So here we are saying three, two, one, Happy New Year. So it's symbolic of this new chapter, right? People were outside and inside looking up at the sky. There were no fireworks because everyone was in awe. I was looking out my bedroom window. So suddenly I'm right here in this very room. You can't see, but there's a window right in front of me. This is a bay window. So I have a window here, here, and here. This direction points east. This direction faces northeast. So I'm looking out this window where everything's happening. It was a brand new year. I told my family that the judgments were about to be poured out on the wicked. That's what this meant. Before the morning, the figures went back into the clouds. I wanted to shout to the world that the Lord was coming. So after I have this dream, and I'm pondering on the fact that in the dream, it was New Year's Eve going into New Year's Day. And then I began to wonder, what day was the Chinese New Year? I hadn't really thought about it, though I had been hearing about it. So I looked it up, and sure enough, it was on Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, the morning that I had this dream. The year of the rabbit, this brand new year, the year of the rabbit, which is the year of the Lord. And in this dream, it was all about this being the beginning of the return of the Lord. It was being ushered in. So I looked up some of these keywords. I was taken to Revelation chapter 6. Fitting, there's that number 6. And it says, Christ opens the six seals. So it talks about these six seals in chapter 6. 
and it talks about the horses. Now it's interesting because there were horses in my dream and there were angels riding the horses and the horsemen were calling to each other to come out and look down at the earth below. And then of course, the book of Revelation goes on to talk about the sixth angel sounding the sixth trumpet, which I felt was very symbolic in my dream. When the sixth trumpet sounds, the four angels that are bound under the great river Euphrates will be loosened. And we've talked about that in recent past videos. This is when the river Euphrates dries up, which it has dried up right now. And these four angels that are loosed are prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay one third of the men on the earth. These are the judgments. And before the seventh angel sounds the seventh trumpet, which ushers in the millennial reign of Christ, there is a great earthquake, which destroys the enemies of Israel. And then the book of Revelation, John talks about this beast. He says another beast comes up out of the earth and he speaks like a dragon. Could 2024, the year of the dragon, be the year that gives rise to this beast. And those who don't worship the image of the beast are killed. So my friend shared this with me earlier in the week and I just finally had a chance to look over it. So I'm gonna show you these screenshots right here and the dots that she was connecting and how it just seems right now that there's so many things happening that are pointing our attention heavenward up to the skies. There seems to be a lot of signs happening in the skies right now, reminding us to keep the faith. Again, this is about the green comet. She sent me the screenshot of this article that says, related, see three days in the life of green comet as it heads towards Earth. On Thursday, January 26, the comet will appear just beside Ursa Minor, the little bear or little dipper. By January 30th, the comet will make its way east toward Camelo Pardalis, where it will appear when it reaches Peregrine on February 1st, which is the Chinese New Year, which is the day I had my dream. By February 10th, the comet will have moved significantly to the east and will appear close to Mars, which might make it easier to spot. Now, when I saw this, I thought about how Mars always symbolizes war. She then shared this with me. So just to mark another hinge point in history, yesterday, January 25th, 2023, President Biden said, Today I'm announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. Last year, March 2022, Biden said, the idea that we're going to send in offensive equipment and have planes and tanks and trains going in with American pilots and American crews, just understand, don't kid yourself. No matter what you all say, that's called World War III. So I saw the green and the red lights shining in the sky. And at the time, I didn't connect that to a comet. I know that comets can be red, they can be green, they can be blue and white and other colors. And I did talk about a comet in that video, but it's interesting because in my dream, it was a new year. We were celebrating New Year's. So this person went on to say, the only difference is that comet was red and green. This one was only green, but maybe that dream is a foreshadowing of what's to come after Yom Kippur. That's why I asked. I remember you talking about seeing a green comet in that dream. You mentioned at the time of the dream it was a new year in the dream, and you mentioned that your dream correlated to the Chinese New Year. I was wondering if you thought if your dream could also be referencing the Jewish New Year Rosh Hashanah. Maybe your dream will come to pass after Jewish New Year and Yom Kippur. Maybe I'm completely off, but that's why I'm asking. Now, in my last video message, I talked about the green comet, and I shared a message that a friend sent me where she talked about a dream that she had. In fact, real quick, I'll share the clip from that video. So a friend of mine reached out to me a few days ago and shared a little bit of a dream that she had had, and it wasn't until a couple days later that I realized this dream had everything to do with what I'm sharing in this video. So I'm going to read just a portion of it. She wrote, God showed me in a dream that a new kind of evil is coming. 
I saw an evil green spirit with a green haze around him with a long beard and hair. So here is a side-by-side -side of the green comet. You can see the green tail that it has almost resembles long hair or a long beard flowing behind it. And in her dream, she said this had a green glow, a green haze all around it. So I reached out to her yesterday and I said, have you heard about the comet that passed by over the weekend? Are you aware of that? And she had not. So she went and looked into it and she wrote me back and said, oh my goodness, it's a green comet. It reminds me of my dream. And I said, that's exactly what I wanted to tell you. I said, I actually recorded a video all about this and your dream completely makes sense. She goes on to write about what she feels the dream meant and she talks about the symbolism and said that she believes this evil has an effect on us over what we see, hear, and read. So things that we're seeing in the media. And she felt that it represented bringing division on all levels into your home and dividing and destroying. It's as though this comment was a sign that this is what's happening right now. This is what's unfolding, this spirit of division, division and destruction. And the adversary seems to be focusing that distraction and that division right now on the church. She felt this was a warning and a caution to be very vigilant and mindful about what you are letting in your home and what you're allowing yourself to watch and listen to and invite into your own soul, into your heart and mind. These seeds of doubt that are being planted right now all over the media are something you don't want to let in. She wrote that she was cautioned over and over in her dream, don't let it in, just don't let it in. She wrote, indeed a storm is coming. God just told me, turn off the media and be with each other. So spend more time focusing on your family and strengthening your family. So this person was reminding me of a dream I had back in February that touched on these similar themes. A new year, the color green in the sky, and knowing that the judgments were about to be poured out upon the wicked. And then a friend of mine has a dream that I shared in the last video message where I made that connection to the green comet. And I just have to say real quick, I did not intentionally wear green in that video. I realized after the fact that I wore green and I just realized that I'm wearing green again today. <laughs> I wasn't even planning on recording a video message today. I was going to do it tomorrow, and I happened to be wearing green. I don't believe in coincidences, but just had to point that out. So here was my reply to this message. I said, so my friend that had the dream about the glowing green spirit with the beard said that her dream led her to study the book of Revelation, the chapter about one third of everything being destroyed. I mentioned that as well in that Revelation video back in February. After talking about my dream, I saw the number 111 a couple of times while pondering this. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. And because they are ones and there are three of them, it reminds me of one third. So think of the fraction one slash three. I continued could be a sign that that's what's next. And Rosh Hashanah is a Saturday going into a Sunday, just like in my dream. On the 21st, it was the 200th anniversary of Angel Moroni visiting Joseph. Seems significant. So my friend who had sent me the message about her dream, she had a dream about a green spirit with a long beard, and I connected it to that comet. While she was pondering that dream, she was led to the book of Revelation, chapter 8. So there it was again, the judgments being poured out upon the wicked. So I talked about that in February pertaining to my dream, which had the green lights in the sky. And then my friend who had a dream about this green spirit that looked like a comet, who was completely unaware that there was a green comet in the headlines that week. Pondering that led her also to study the book of Revelation all about the judgments being poured out upon the wicked, with one-third of everything being destroyed. So this person had made that connection and reached out and shared it with me. And as I was pondering it, I began to think about, in the movie, The Ten Commandments, with Charlton Heston, who plays Moses, <laughs> When it depicts the destroying angel coming over Egypt, 
here's a screenshot. It depicts it as a green mist, just like in my friend's dream. This was the destroying angel that killed all the firstborn sons who didn't have the mark of the blood of the lamb painted on their doorway. This same destroying angel oversees the destruction of the wicked and those judgments that are poured out. Now, right around this same time that this person reached out to me and made this connection with my video back in February and my last Happy Lady video message, another person reached out to me, and none of these people are connected, by the way, and he shared with me a video to one of my favorite podcasters that I hadn't seen. In fact, I'll have a link to this down below if you want to watch it, where he talked all about the symbolism in the temple pertaining to the topic of being marked for the blessings of the Lord versus what I want to call the curses of the adversary or that destroying angel. And in that video, he brought up how the children of Israel painted the lamb's blood around their door so that the destroying angel would pass over them, as mentioned in the book of Exodus. Now, I always say pay attention to patterns, and for me, they come in sets of three. So there it was, my video in February, my friend's dream that I shared in the last video, and this person who reached out to me with another video all about the same topic. There it was three times being brought to my attention within a period of 24 hours. To me, that said, pay attention. Now, during this time, as soon as this person had brought to my attention this correlation between the video in February and my last video message, instantly I started seeing 111 everywhere. In fact, here is a screenshot of all the places I saw it just popping up everywhere. The first place I saw it was on the very video that had been brought to my attention. The video called Revelation 13 and My Dream. There it was down in the likes. One, one, one. Within minutes from that, I began to see it everywhere on news articles talking about people seeking immortality in all the wrong ways to all of the news surrounding Tim Ballard there it was again 111 to a news story about 20 Latter-day Saint churches being burglarized this past week an interesting contrast to the 20 new temples that President Nelson just announced at this last general conference to be built all over the world. To a video about chastity in relation to Amish values and principles. To my reply to the person who reminded me about my video in which I thanked her for bringing it up. I happened to reply to her, of course, at 1.11 p.m. And while editing this video, I receive a text from a friend asking me to help her with a favor at 1.11 p.m. This favor had to do with the Forgotten Carols production. Also, while editing this video, I had to take a break and take two of my children to a doctor's appointment. And it was really funny because one of my children, when they got their blood pressure taken, one of the numbers on their blood pressure was 111, and then the other child got weighed and happened to weigh 113 pounds. Now, I always reference 311 to 3rd Nephi chapter 11. However, while editing this video, when I looked at the number 113, that one in the center suddenly took on a new meaning. It looked like the dividing line of a fraction. I have a screenshot up if you want to take a look. Suddenly 113 looked like the fraction one third. A third, which is what we've been talking about in this video, in Revelation chapter 13. Now normally that wouldn't stand out to me. I don't go around looking for numbers, but I do notice patterns. And I noticed that it was a pattern that I was seeing 111 popping up everywhere within the first hour of this being brought to my attention and on into the following 24 hours. And again, the more I thought about it and pondered on it, the number one and having three of those ones, to me, in my mind, I saw one and three. 
So the number 13, which reminded me of a fraction, one over three, one third. One third is what connects all three of these pieces. All three of these video messages talked about the judgments that are poured out on one third of the people. In other words, the wicked. So this is Bryce Dunford, who has his own YouTube channel, but also has a podcast on YouTube called Talking Scriptures. I'm going to share just a piece from his video. Here's what he says. The first thing you do to a newborn baby is you wash them. Now, if this newborn baby were, for example, Simba, what happened the moment Simba was born? What happens the moment a future king is born? He's anointed. So first we wash, and then we're going to anoint the future queen, the future king. And then, what would you do to a newborn baby? You clothe them. Hence, what do you expect to see in the temple? A washing, an anointing, and a clothing. And then tell me what this baby needs. What else are we going to do to a newborn baby? Usually before you leave the hospital. My wife and I always did it before we left the hospital. We gave the baby a name. So let's talk about the symbolism of anointing. Not just in the temple, but anywhere you see an anointing. Can you think of a time where Israel was anointed, was marked, and a blessing resulted? Because they put a mark on themselves, the Lord sent a blessing. Do you remember Passover? If they put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, if they anointed their house with lamb's blood, that house was protected and shielded, and the destroying angel passed over them. Do you see that dual nature? If they marked themselves, then God marked them and told the destroying angel, nah, -uh, not this house. You pass them by. Speaking of marking our doors, this made headlines last week. This is from KUTV2 News. It says, for three straight years, the study by Lombardo Homes has crowned Utah as the state that is the most devoted to decorating for the Halloween holiday. I always say things that repeat are patterns and where you see a pattern, pay attention. It's interesting, the number three, this is the third year in a row that Utah has won this title. Pondering this brings the question to mind, what are you marking your door with? What are you marking your home with? What are you marking on your temple? The real act here was to put Jesus on them. If I put Jesus on me, if I put the atonement on me, then the Lord marks me for a blessing and passes me by. And I love this article from the church website titled, Shielded by Covenants. It says, President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained one of the blessings we can expect when we wear the garment properly. The garment represents sacred covenants. It fosters modesty and becomes a shield and a protection to the wearer. So for those of you who have been through the temple and received your washing and anointing and participated in that initiatory ordinance, remember what it was you were promised. Remember what it is or who it is that the garments symbolize. Who is it? we are putting on us every time we wear the temple garments. If we can remember that and we truly believe it, we would never want to take them off. The article says, this shield can protect us from what Nephi called the fiery darts of the adversary. If we could calculate how many darts Satan throws at us every single day, I imagine the number would be astronomical. We live in a world that actively seeks to destroy what we believe. Inappropriate images and messages surround us everywhere, along with pressure to use harmful substances or break the law of chastity. 
even more rampant is the pressure and temptation to argue and to be unkind, either in person or especially online, to mock or belittle others for expressing their opinions or beliefs, or to tease a person for something as small as a grammatical mistake. These spiritual attacks, if heeded, dull our senses and reduce our ability to sense warnings from the Holy Ghost. When the temple was destroyed, right before, right after Lehi leaves for America, remember why Lehi left? Because Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the temple was going to be destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. Right before that, Ezekiel was the prophet and he had this marvelous vision. In chapter 9, watch what happened. First, we saw these angels holding slaughter weapons approach. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Verse 2, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, now watch the mark get placed upon them. Ready? This is where the mark, they're going to be anointed. And in, in Passover, it was by blood. Sometimes it's by oil, but they're going to be marked. Now watch them get marked. Verse four, the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the forehead of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let your eyes spare not, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Now that image is going to happen one more time in our day. The book of Revelation, speaking of our day, again, we see destroying angels. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, this time we see four angels holding back the four corners of the earth, not just Jerusalem anymore, but the whole earth, holding back the destruction that's ready to cleanse the earth. And he says, you hold on, you wait. And then in verse 2, there's an angel who ascends up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And then he cried loud to the four winds, saying, four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So give us time to anoint the righteous to put a mark on the righteous. Now jump to chapter nine, when the destruction is unleashed and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now jumping forward to chapter 13, there's another image that comes into play. And I think it has a lot to do with our temples and anointing. There's another entity that would like to put a mark on us. In chapter 13, we're introduced to this beast that rises up out of the sea in the image of the, of the kingdoms of the world. So imagine all celestial things in our world taking a shape. And that beast, verse seven, is at war with the saints. The celestial world and the celestial world are not friends and they are warring with each other. I cannot be celestial and celestial at the same time for very long. Either I can't let go of the celestial things and I'll be sucked in fully into the celestial world, or I will let go of celestial and be consumed by this celestial. So by the same token, this beast that represents the celestial kingdom, the kingdoms of the world wants to claim me and they are at war with the saints of God. Now look at verse 16. What does this beast want from me? And he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads. So 
the beast, the symbol of the celestial world, wants to mark me for his blessing. Now notice the blessing, ready? Verse 17, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. You can't play in their playground if you don't have their mark. So it's the same idea. See the idea? The beast wants to put a mark on you. He wants to anoint you for his blessing. And if you will put his mark on you so that you can play in his playground, you will receive his blessing. You have anointed yourself with the things of a celestial world. Therefore, you cannot be blessed by a celestial power. The Book of Mormon is going to put some meat on these bones. In Alma chapter 2, we find the story of the Amlicites. The Amlicites marked themselves with red in the forehead. Now, why red in the forehead? Finishing verse 4, after the manner of the Lamanites. So, the Lamanites had red in their forehead. So, the Amlicites took a distinguishing characteristic of the Lamanites and put it upon themselves so that they could identify with the team that they're on. And they put it upon themselves to receive the Lamanites blessing. I want the Lamanites protection. I want the Lamanites acceptance. I want the Lamanites to protect me against the Nephites. So I will take the marks of the Lamanites and put it on me. Now let's think about how that applies to the beast that we saw in the book of Revelation. The celestial world is very much like the Lamanites. And there are those who are saying, I want your blessing. I want to fit in. I want to be one of you. I'm on your team. I'm not a Nephite. I'm on your team. So they take the images of the world and they put those images on themselves. They take the language of the world and they put it on themselves. The thoughts, the attitudes, the clothing, they mark up their skin with ink. They take the world's images and cover themselves with it. Why? To receive the world's blessings so that they can play in the world's playground. Now, what might be the oil with which I'm marking my mind? How do I tell Heavenly Father I want His blessings? If I fill my mind with the things of God, then God will fill my mind with the things of God. There's a beautiful moment in the Chronicles of Narnia where a young man turns into a dragon. And C.S. Lewis included this phrase, he had turned into a dragon while he slept, sleeping on a dragon's hoard with greedy dragonish thoughts in his heart. He had become a dragon himself. I am going to fill my life. I'm going to fill my thoughts with celestial things. I'm going to mark myself with what I think about. I invite you to adopt the practice of thinking celestial. Thinking celestial means being spiritually minded. We learn from the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob that to be spiritually minded is life eternal. Mortality is a master class in learning to choose the things of greatest eternal import. Far too many people live as though this life is all there is. However, your choices today will determine three things where you will live throughout all eternity, the kind of body with which you will be resurrected, and those with whom you will live forever. So, think celestial. President Nelson's message at conference couldn't have been timed better. Everything I had been pondering just days before general conference all led up to this moment, to President Nelson's message. 
So I had been pondering all of this leading into conference. Now let's talk about conference and the themes that I picked up on that reinforce this message. So the very first session of conference was probably my favorite. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's because I attended it in person with my son, which made the experience even more incredible, or if it's really because the messages addressed what I had been pondering. So that very first talk by Elder Bednar, as soon as he brought up they of the last wagon, I know it wasn't just me. I know so many people out there immediately took that to mean not just those of the last dispensation, but members of the church who are in the very last part of the last dispensation. All of us, right? I absolutely loved how he talked about all of those members who serve under the radar. People don't always know the service that they give. Not everybody knows their names, but what they do is every bit as important as members of the church who serve in big leadership capacities where everybody knows their names. <laughs> and he talks about how they of the last wagon sort of ate the dust of everyone before them. And he compares it to today, how sometimes it can feel overwhelming. Serving in your calling and putting forth so much effort and hard work with zero recognition. Nobody really knows what it is you do or the effort you put into your calling. Some people may feel overwhelmed, underappreciated. But what Elder Bednar focuses on is their faith. Relying on their faith to endure to the end, regardless of how difficult it is being in the last wagon. One minute and 44 seconds into this particular video recording right when I said that. But instantly, I related to that, as I know so many of you did, that this was a message to us to hold to our faith and endure to the end. After that, Sister Amy Wright talked about the parable of the ten virgins, which sort of reinforced Elder Bednar's message that we are in that last wagon before the bridegroom comes. And she talked about how important it is to have that oil in your lamp. So when that moment comes, you can be let into the wedding celebration. She talked about having more holy experiences, pressing forward, feasting on the word, and enduring to eternal life, and also having joy now. I loved that. And I had recently talked about the parable of the ten virgins a couple of videos ago when I talked all about the plan of salvation, which was brought up in this conference. And in that first session, Elder D. Todd Christofferson asked the question, what is the purpose of this gathering? And he answered that question by saying, it's for the defense and protection against the wrath of natural consequences poured out upon the disobedient. In other words, the wicked. And I love how he referred to those judgments as natural consequences. In other words, those who choose to suffer for their own sins in this life. Choosing disobedience, having a wicked and rebellious heart, the natural consequences of those choices will be poured out upon those people. So there it was. That is exactly what I had been pondering leading up to conference. That pattern of the judgments being poured out upon the wicked. It was addressed in the very first session of General Conference by D. Todd Christofferson. And he pointed out that the gathering of Israel that we participate in every day serves as a defense and a protection against those judgments that will be poured out upon the wicked. In other words, if we're keeping our covenants and participating in this great work of the gathering of Israel, we will be protected from that destruction, from those judgments. And he reminded everyone that God's pattern for eternal families begins with you. Don't be that weak link that breaks the chain, that decides to walk away from the covenant path. Because think about all of the consequences that not only puts on you, but your posterity. 
they miss out on all of those blessings because of your choice to break the link in the chain. I think we all know so many people right now who have chosen to leave the covenant path or to walk away from the church. And we've seen the effects that that's had on their marriage, their children, and their entire family. And the domino effect that that has in a community and in society. He encouraged everyone watching to restore the broken links. Get back on the covenant path. So the two things that I was really hoping would be addressed at General Conference absolutely were. I know someone who had been struggling with paying tithing, not necessarily the concept of it, but just never really felt that it was that important because it's something we don't hear about that often anymore like we used to, sort of out of sight, out of mind. And also, I know of a lot of people who are struggling with obsessions, or in other words, idols, something that they put above the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead of putting building God's kingdom as priority on their list, they have chosen other things to replace that and take priority in their life. Something that they are very passionate about and think about 24-7 brings them excitement, gets them out of bed in the morning. And sometimes when pondering this, I refer to it as an idol or an obsession. So to me, it was very interesting that those exact words were used when addressing this topic in conference. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So two patterns that stood out to me were the topic of tithing and the use of quoting President Nelson on the same quote over and over throughout conference. Because those were patterns that repeated, to me, that said, pay attention. Now, the first pattern was the topic of tithing, first brought up by Elder Anderson. Then in that same first session, Elder Costa mentioned paying tithing. And then Elder Yoon Hwan Choi brought up the importance of paying tithing, as did President Nelson, who ended conference, who was the last speaker. He brought up paying tithing and the blessings that come from that and how those are blessings that we need right now in our lives. So paying tithing and receiving blessings from that was mentioned three times very specifically and a fourth time in Elder Costa's talk as part of being obedient and keeping covenants. Now I know tithing has been a hot topic coming up lately as there have been a lot of people who are sort of using that as a reason to walk away from the church or to lose their faith. There's even a headline recently in the news about a millionaire in California trying to sue the church so that they will pay him back all the tithing he's ever contributed over the years since he no longer has a testimony and has left the church. He now wants millions of dollars in tithing paid back to him because according to him, He wasn't fully aware of how tithing is used, and he felt he was misled. So I love that it was brought up during conference very specifically the purpose of tithing, how it's used, and how it's a blessing to us when we faithfully pay it out of obedience. I will have links to these talks regarding these topics down in the video description below this video if you want to watch them. Now the second pattern was quoting from two of President Nelson's talks. The first one, titled, Revelation for the Church, Revelation for Our Lives, from the April 2018 General Conference. The second talk that was quoted more than once was, Overcome the World and Find Rest, from October 2022 General Conference, so a year ago. Now, in the very first session of this general conference, so Saturday morning, the session that I attended, Elder Anderson and Elder Costa both quoted this quote from President Nelson's talk from a year ago. In coming days, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns, With power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. So a prophecy of great 
blessings. And then Elder Stevens and President Eyring quoted this quote from President Nelson in the April 2018 General Conference, where he gave a warning in which he said, In coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. We've all heard that one many times. And it was quoted twice at this general conference. So a total of four mentions of two quotes from President Nelson that both started out with, in coming days. Not months, not years, but days. Meaning we've already been seeing this being fulfilled. We've seen a lot of people shedding that spirit of personal revelation out of their life and choosing to follow a different spirit. We've seen a lot of people receiving personal revelation from false sources, which has led to a lot of people following those people off of the covenant path. In other words, a lot of people experiencing that spiritual death, cutting themselves off from that true revelation from the Lord by inviting another spirit a spirit of deception into their life from the choices that they make. And all of the people following those people who also subscribed to that same spirit of deception and had lost that gift of discernment are also experiencing that spiritual death, choosing to sever that connection to the spirit of the Lord. And on the flip side, we've also been seeing a lot of people experiencing incredible miracles and blessings in their lives. In other words, great manifestations of the Savior's power because of their faith and that connection to the Spirit of the Lord, being connected to that true line of personal revelation. It's as though these apostles and leaders of the church were reminding us of this prophetic counsel of warnings and blessings from our prophet of how they are coming to pass, of how they have since come to pass and are continuing to come to pass until the Lord returns. Now, there was a lot of mentioning of temple covenants and the importance of keeping those covenants and how they serve to protect and strengthen us against all of this, against the adversary in these last days. There was so much mentioning of covenants, I wasn't able to write it all down, but it was frequently brought up, especially the mentioning of wearing the temple garment, how important that is. Sister Freeman brought that up where she talked about the reason she wears her temple garments is because she wants to be in a committed covenant relationship with the Lord. Keeping our covenants shows the level of commitment we have to the Lord, shows what kind of a relationship we have with Him. And that commitment comes with great blessings. One of those great blessings is protection that we need in these last days. And I've personally noticed a lot of major influencers and Latter-day Saint celebrities that have been gradually walking away from the covenant path have also made the choice at one time or another in their profession regarding their professional goals and achievements. They have chose not to wear those temple garments to increase their chances of appeasing whomever it is that stands between them and their personal goals and achievements. In other words, wanting to look the part of the role they need to play at that time to achieve the outcome that they desire. Temple garments and modesty are a dead giveaway (laughs) that you are a covenant-keeping Latter-day Saint. And if that's not quite the message you're wanting to send to whomever it is you're trying to win over and gain favor with to achieve the outcome you need. And I want to pause right there. A lot of these people justified it and said, well, well, in the moment, it doesn't seem to look right or make sense. But if I can achieve what it is I'm trying to accomplish and get this trophy that I'm going after or be the hero in this situation, then that will bring light to the restored gospel, to the church that I belong to. 
because then I'll receive a bigger platform where I can tell people I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'll have more credibility, more subscribers and followers and supporters, and I can bring people to the Lord. But first, I have to get that credibility. I have to earn that platform, and I have to please these other people who are sort of standing in the way. So I have to be covert and appease them. So I've got to remove these temple garments, but it's temporary and then it will lead to something good. So I've noticed that that's sort of been the pattern, and it starts out that way with those intentions, and then one day of not wearing temple garments leads to another day, leads to another day, leads to a week, leads to a month, and during all of that time, these people are standing outside of that covenant protection from the adversary, which makes them vulnerable to his deceptions. And then as they begin to make choices, inviting more of that deception into their lives, they begin to lose that discernment. And then they take all of their followers and supporters with them down that path. It's like the whole concept of being on the airplane and when the masks come down, we're taught to put an oxygen mask on ourselves first before we help our child or the person sitting next to us. Because if we're trying to help them first, then we start to lose oxygen and then we're of no use to help anyone else. In other words, if we begin to lose our spiritual oxygen, which leads to a spiritual death, how are we going to help those around us? How are we going to help bring other people to Jesus Christ, to his restored gospel? If we choose to step outside of that protection and become vulnerable to the adversary, weakening our spirit and losing that spiritual strength, How can the Lord use us to point people to him? There's nothing out there that's worth sacrificing your oxygen, your spiritual lifeline, in order to save. And I've heard it justified time and time again by so many people. Whether they're trying to save a person, a life, a cause, whatever it is, it's not worth sacrificing your own spiritual survival over. No matter how much you try to justify it, the Lord would rather you be obedient to your covenants. If it's his will for you to be a hero in a certain situation and to save people or bring light to a cause, whatever it is, he will find a way to make that happen. And his plan won't involve you stepping outside of your covenants and removing yourself from his protection. In other words, playing around with fire without a hose or a fire extinguisher within your reach. Now, Elder Renlund's talk really stood out to me. He addressed something I had been pondering ahead of conference, which was people who idolize others and look to those idols for their treasure. And in doing so, they look beyond the mark. I absolutely loved his talk and felt that it was so relevant for our day. So I have a link to his talk as well down below in the video description. And I have a link to all of General Conference for those of you who haven't watched it and would like to. Now, as I'm recording this video, the transcripts aren't out yet, so I can't read through and look for certain quotes. I have to listen to the videos to find what it is I reference in my notes. So hopefully by the time this video gets out, those transcripts will be out and you can read it and do keyword searches. It's always much more helpful to be able to read it as well as listen to it. So President Nelson spoke one time at this general conference which I expected. I told my family he's probably made one video recording of one message that I'm sure will involve the announcing of temples, which means he'll be the last speaker of General Conference. And that's exactly what happened. And he announced 20 temples to be built all over the world, which brings his total announcement of temples to be built since he first became president of the church to a grand total of 153 temples. That is amazing. This marks the second time he has announced 20 temples to be built at a general conference, which is the most ever announced at one time. To me, this just goes to show that protection and defense and refuge that's being built up all over the world to prepare for what's coming. 
if our covenants are what protect us from the coming judgments of the wicked, from that destruction that's about to be poured out, then it would make sense to increase those temples, those fortresses. It really is a battle of good versus evil, the Lord's kingdom versus the adversary's kingdom. And those temples serve as fortresses. And the more fortresses that we build all over the world, that protects and strengthens the Lord's covenant people. Again, it always reminds me of the pieces on a chessboard. Building temples not only grows the kingdom of God on the earth, but it's a strategy against the adversary. So in September, we celebrated President Nelson's 99th birthday, and many have pointed out that on his birthday, there was an earthquake in Morocco. So there was a shaking on his birthday, which means that he has now entered his 100th year. And also on his birthday, the green comet appeared in the Leo constellation. Remember, Leo is the lion. The lion represents the tribe of Judah and also Jesus Christ. So interesting that this green comet that almost symbolizes that destroying angel, just like in the book of Exodus, it happens to cross over through the Leo constellation, that symbol of Judah or the Jews and also Jesus Christ on the prophet's birthday. And then shortly later at General Conference, he announces 20 new temples, in other words, fortresses of the Lord, houses of the Lord to be built all over the earth. It will be exciting to see what takes place between now and the next General Conference in April of 2024, which takes place shortly before the great American eclipse that crosses over the United States. It crosses over the New Madrid fault line. We all know that it seems very significant with the location and the timing of everything. It really feels like between now and then, that covenant protection will be more essential than ever before as those judgments are poured out upon the disobedient. Whether it gradually happens between now and then, or it happens all at once, we can have peace as we stand in holy places and hold tight to our covenants. It almost feels like this comet symbolizes that destroying angel coming down and passing over all of those who have the mark of the Lamb on their foreheads. In other words, that covenant relationship. I found it interesting that in Revelation chapter 9, there's a lot of reference to heads and tails. It almost sounds like the flipping of a coin, heads or tails. It almost reminds me of those quarters that I found that I talked about in a recent video. But when I think of heads and tails, I also think of a comet. You think about the head of the comet and the tail. And it says in verse 18, by these three were the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. So we have this comet that passes over the earth during Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. So this green comet almost heralding in this new year. And then we had the completion of the supermoons this last week, which during the time of this last supermoon, the harvest moon, we see major flooding in New York City. Everything's underwater, which the news referred to as record-breaking rainfall and Flooding. The key word that stands out to me for that moon is harvest. Here is an image of New York flooding. Look at the bottom. There's that pay attention number 144, which represents the gathering of Israel. In other words, the harvest. It's as though we see the reaper coming to reap the final harvest. Here it is again, popping up on President Nelson's Instagram page. As of this day, while editing this video, he had had 144 posts. And it continued to pop up everywhere. I always see it pertaining to my kids, especially my oldest. And there it was again, it popped up when I was sending my family a text 
about my son and I attending general conference together. There was that number up at the top, 4.41 p.m. is when I sent the text. There is something so special about this generation, and my son is the graduating class of 2024. They graduate a month after the Great American Eclipse. A video popped up on YouTube about Yom Kippur, and there was that number again, 144, the gathering of Israel, the harvest. And then there was this local news story that happened to be about a family in one of my siblings' neighborhoods. It says, small Utah town grappling with loss of 19-year-old in explosion. And there was that pay attention number, 113, 311. A reminder to be like the people in 3rd Nephi chapter 11, which is exactly what this community did as they rallied around this family during their loss. Be like the people in 3rd Nephi chapter 11 so we can be ready for what's coming with the one-third that will be destroyed. And then coming up in October on the 14th, we have the annual solar eclipse that crosses over the North American and South American continents. It's known as the Ring of Fire Solar Eclipse. And here's a screenshot right here of the pathway it will take and where it will make an X over Texas next year with the coming solar eclipse of 2024. So two X's to pay attention to next year due to the total solar eclipse. We have Missouri and Texas. So during this eclipse, the sky grows darker and it almost appears to be dusk. In fact, it says in news reports that animals may begin to behave like they do at dusk during this eclipse. So it takes place on October 14th, which happens to be the transition date between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. So Yom Kippur is coming out of atonement. It's that repentance process. And then Sukkot celebrates the great final harvest. So this ring of fire appears in the sky right in between that transition of atonement to final harvest. And that second great American eclipse in April of 2024 precedes the observance of Passover, which commemorates the destroying angel who passed over the children of Israel who were marked with the blood of the Lamb. I don't think it's a coincidence with all of these signs in the heavens that are gaining national and worldwide media attention, causing us to look up. It really does feel like the message at this general conference was to reinforce our testimony of the protection of our temple covenants. And as we look up, to all that's happening in the heavens, we can have peace knowing of that sure protection promised to us for remaining steadfast in our covenants and enduring to the end. Remember, nothing is worth sacrificing your spiritual protection or covenants over. The adversary will tell you otherwise, but don't fall for his deception. I know that as we do this, as we hold fast to that protection, we will be blessed and we will have that peace. I know this is true and I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. I would love to hear your comments down below. I would love to hear your thoughts about conference. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a wonderful week and I will see you next time.